Hello, and it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, Plotin of Showin webinar. My name is Ilya Kranuha, and I'm the Business Development Manager at World Forum of Showwind. It's my great pleasure uh, to welcome today our great uh, panel and uh, of, of speakers. First of all, I would like to introduce you to Bruno Gersher, uh, our um, Plotin of Showwind chairperson. Uh, then also, I'm very happy to welcome Joanna kluczewska boldier from EDF, uh, Christoph Knopp from uh, ENBW, and Aaron Smith from Principal Power. And before we jump into the presentation, let me tell you a few things uh, about WFO. Our organization was founded in 2018, and we are a nonprofit entity focused exclusively on offshore wind. We promote offshore wind energy globally, and our members represent the complete offshore wind um, value chain. We have an international setup with offices in Hamburg, Tokyo, Taipei, and New York. And in terms of our activities, uh, it's very straightforward as we focus on three uh, things. We provide advisory services for offshore wind around the world. We inform about offshore wind. We have publishing periodic reports, facilitating various working groups such as floating, hydrogen, uh, and conflict resolution. And of course, we organize events such as workshops, webinars, uh, evening receptions, international forums, to name just a few. Uh, so we connect the global offshore wind community. And if you are somehow still not a member uh, of, of us, please join us and uh, feel free to contact our managing director, Gunnar Herzig. And here on this slide, uh, you can uh, see uh, our current member. We have over 110 members from around the world, and we're delighted to have companies from all segments of the value chain, from North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Um, and a few words about the structure of this webinar, which is very simple. During the first half of this webinar, Joanna, Christoph, and Aaron will present on the topic and during the second part of the webinar, uh, they will answer to your questions. Uh, the Q&A session today will be moderated by uh, Bruno Gersher, and each of you can ask a question using the chat function on the right-hand side. So now it's my great pleasure to give a floor to Bruno. Uh, Bruno, over to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ilya. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Bruno Gescher, uh, Chief Sales and Marketing Officer at BW Ideal, and also uh, the very lucky uh, Chairman of uh, WFO's Floating Offshore Wind Committee. Um, I'm very pleased today and, and quite honored to have such a panel of experts uh, joining us today. Uh, you've heard me say it probably on, on numerous occasions, floating wind is a fast-growing, high-potential industry. Um, but where there is very little room for improvisation for amateurs and for lack of experience given the billions at stake. So I'm very pleased to have uh, to see Joanna, Christoph and Aaron being able to share their vision on challenges um, of, of uh, and the current and future challenges of floating wind. Uh, we couldn't find better experts on the subject. Uh, secondly, and just to, to finish this introduction on a, on a positive note. Um, I don't know if some of you have uh, followed the news the last few days, few weeks, but um, we, we have to congratulate France's first bottom fixed. Uh, yes, I'm talking about bottom fix here, even though we are in a floating wind um, event here, but um, uh, the, 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 the tremendous capacity factor that um, uh, France's first offshore wind farm, bottom fix offshore wind farm, has experienced over the last three months. Um, congrats to EDF, and where we saw uh, an average close to 50%. Um, ironically, a few miles from there, you have a floating wind turbine uh, operating there for several years that during that same period experienced a capacity factor of close to 60%. So there's plenty of reasons to rejoice over the potential and the tremendous potential of, of offshore wind in general. And another good reason to see that floating wind is definitely uh, a, great, a great opportunity to provide more uh, renewable energy, hopefully at better cost, to the uh, end, end user. So uh, I thought I would start with this very positive and encouraging news. Floating is here, floating is here to stay, and there will be more and more of it. 
Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to uh, Joanna, which um, which I've known for several years now, and which is who's as technical lead for floating wind projects at EDF Renewables, undoubtedly one of the great experts in the industry. Uh, she has a background. I mean, before joining EDF, she worked on NFR, had the experience of um, vertical axis wind turbines also, but certainly someone that has a great talent um, from um, in terms of uh, overall technical project management within the floating wind landscape. Up to you, and uh, Joanna, and thanks again for joining us today. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you for this uh, introduction. I'm very happy to be here, uh, and I'm very happy to be discussing uh, with all the panelists uh, the current and uh, future challenges of uh, floating offshore wind. Uh, so let me share with you a few slides that will hopefully serve as a basis of, uh, of discussion for us today on this uh, challenging uh, subject. Uh, before I start talking about uh, floating wind in particular, uh, let me quickly introduce EDF. Uh, so EDF, or Electricité de France, is a global leader in low carbon electricity. Uh, we have over 123 gigawatts of installed power, 60% uh, of it is nuclear, but we are very active in developing renewables. Uh, we have a diversi diversified mix of renewables uh, in our portfolio, including hydro power, uh, wind and solar. We are leader for renewables in France and leader in uh, Europe. Uh, but we are also uh, we are also a global uh, player uh, with uh, over 38 million customers uh, worldwide, um, and we have uh, a, a subsidy uh, called EDF uh, Renewables that is dedicated um, to developing, building, and operating renewable power generation. Um, we have all, uh, over 10 gigawatts of installed capacity in wind and solar uh, and over 5 gigawatts either being commissioned or uh, under construction. Uh, so we have uh, over 4,000 uh, employees in over 20 countries. Uh, all of them are dedicated to um, developing responsible and value-creating projects. And we are, of course, as a company, very serious in uh, fighting against climate change. Few words about EDF renewals and, uh, uh, and floating wind farms. So I'd like to present to you our portfolio. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a demonstrator project, uh, a demonstration wind farm called PGL. Uh, I will talk more about this wind farm in, in a few minutes, um, but let me give you a quick uh, overview of uh, other, our projects. So we are very active in uh, preparing tenders this year. Uh, I can mention here uh, a tender in Norway for Utsira Nor project, uh, or uh, tenders uh, in France, currently ongoing, um, uh, one in uh, Brittany and the other in Mediterranean uh, Sea, uh, as well as uh, other projects worldwide. So here I can mention our project Ocean Harvest in Taiwan, uh, Gwyn Glass project in UK, uh, um, and the portfolio of a uh, project in Newcastle, Australia. So we are very serious about, uh, about floating wind. Uh, and we like to keep what we call a 360 degree vision portfolio, uh, meaning that um, we are, in, in, in terms of floater technology choice, we are adapting a floater type to a given project needs um, and, and design to project specification. So I can mention here uh, that we are using tension like platform from SBM um, on our PGL project, and also that we have chosen a BW Ideal concrete barge uh, for our uh, project uh, in, in France that I have mentioned uh, before. Um, so now let me tell you about a few current technical challenges. Um, obviously, I won't, cannot be exhaustive in just a few minutes, uh, but I'd li like to mention a few uh, challenges that we faced on our pilot wind farm. So our pilot wind farm is called PGL. It's an abbreviation for Provence Grand Large. Uh, it's a, a wind farm that uh, will be installed in Mediterranean, approximately 
14 kilometers from land uh, in sea depth of uh, around 100 meters. Uh, it's a wind farm of 25 megawatts, so we will have three wind turbines installed. These are Siemens Gamesa 8.3 megawatt wind turbines installed on uh, floaters of TLP tied by uh, SVM, uh, and we are using 66 kV uh, dynamic cables on, on this project. We are currently in the construction uh, phase uh, of the floater that is in its final stages and we are preparing installation of the, uh, of the floaters uh, this year and we are very excited about, uh, about this. It's an important milestone for us. Uh, so uh, let me share a few pictures but uh, as well a few learnings uh, from our, our project. Uh, first of all, I'd like to mention the certification process since it's a process that was uh, uh, very structuring for us uh, in, in, uh, in, in this project. Um, and uh, here I, I'll give you a few examples of technical challenges related to it. Um, so first of all, uh, many of you know that norms and standards are, for floating are still new, are still in development. Uh, and uh, as well, project certification uh, at the time of, uh, of PGL uh, was very new, both to us uh, and to the certification bodies, which means that we had to work with them uh, to, to adapt many of the, of the standards to floating uh, specificities uh, and uh, understand how to tackle uh, innovations that are numerous on such projects um, regarding the certification. So one thing that we could mention is, for example, turbulence intensity measurements, uh, which are uh, quite challenging, but turbulence intensity uh, is very important for the design of, um, of floating and, and uh, particularly uh, TLP uh, floaters. So we had put in place a process for those measurements that was verified by DNVGL and then approved by Bureau Veritas uh, for, uh, for PGL for the certification. During the certification as well, um, we had to clarify scope and extent of um, load, uh, load analysis performed. For this, we, uh, we need a special adapted numerical tools. Uh, so as uh, most of you know, a uh, couple tools are very important for floating to understand correctly turbine floater interaction. Uh, today, uh, thanks to PGL project, uh, EDF Renewables benefit of uh, our own advanced numerical couple tools uh, that are completely adapt to, to floating uh, design. Another important aspect uh, is cable, a dynamic cable. So here again, we see a lot of innovations. Uh, on PGL, we are using specific acoustic and temperature monitoring, as well as specifically designed connection and disconnection system. Uh, and again, this was very important as a part of certification process, uh, but also um, in all, order to comply with insurance requirements, for instance. Uh, in this project as well, we have put in place real-scale fatigue testing uh, for, for the cables, um, simulating a load cycle on for meteocean conditions for, for, for the project. In the end, we um, got the certification for PGL in uh, April uh, 2022, and we are very proud of, uh, of this important milestone. A little bit more about other challenges um, for pilot wind farms. These are also related to construction and installation. So we're currently in the heart of it. Uh, here I can mention that um, there are obviously critical operations uh, that take place in the harbor, like construction or assembly uh, or lifting operations. Here it is very important uh, to have adapted key site uh, with uh, important with proper load capacity, uh, proper water depth, uh, but also um, it's very important to manage co-activities uh, on a harbor um, and cooperate with all the operators and stakeholders. Another critical point uh, for uh, lifting operations, and I will also get uh, to this back a little bit later on, um, is the part when we are assembling the turbine, turbine on a floater at the key site. 
so today the nacelles of wind turbines are identical to fixed bottom projects um, and indeed sometimes it's challenging in terms of uh, nacelle uh, tower floater assembly uh, so it is important that for future projects especially, uh, when we're talking about a big commercial scale, uh, wind turbines can be more and more adapted to, uh, to floating. Uh, obviously here for PGL we have found proper ways to adapt uh, uh, and install Siemens Gamesa wind turbine or on SPM floaters, uh, but it's an, it's an important uh, and critical operation to be taken into account um, in, in, all, in our floating project. Uh, so to sum up, um, this PGL project was really important for us as a project leading to commercial wind farm deployment. So first of all, we've learned a lot in terms of design, innovation and construction uh, with many challenges that were, um, that were dealt with uh, because it's a very innovating project. Another aspect that was important for us was financing. So uh, PGL is the first floating project financed by commercial banks, which opens a way uh, for larger project being uh, financed this way. Um, and, uh, and another point that was also quite quite important uh, was to test the project management organization. So despite, despite the limited scale of such a project with only three uh, free floaters, it enabled us to experiment and test the organization uh, that can now be fully adapted to the deployment of uh, commercial scale uh, floating wind farms. So now a little bit about the future. How do we pave the way for big, big scale floating projects and uh, how do we bring the cost down? Because this is an important barrier for, uh, for full gigawatt scale deployment of floating wind. Uh, so first of all, um, in, in my point of view, most of the design or let's say basic technical challenges related to floating uh, and floating wind turbine designs have already been well identified thanks to demonstrator projects and uh, different pilot wind farms uh, that have been or are being deployed around the world. I think most people are not convinced that floating wind turbines work, uh, that floating wind projects, as Bruno mentioned, can perform well. Um, so now the question is how do we deploy um, floating to gigawatt scale commercial wind farms? There are a few technical challenges um, that, that uh, I think are, are quite important. Uh, first of all, as I've already mentioned, wind turbine adaptation. Um, so future gigascale commercial wind farm will benefit greatly from uh, new wind turbine designs that could be specifically adapted to floating, not only from a controller point of view, but also in terms of other wind turbine components. And the second point is obviously a floater. Um, here, I think we all agree that mass construction and standardization are key. Uh, for this, the infrastructure is really important uh, because we need infrastructure that is capable of uh, supporting construction at industrial scale. Uh, for this, we need harbors that are adapted in size and capacities to such projects. Uh, and obviously, we cannot forget about the supply chain because supply chain will also be crucial in deployment of such projects. And last and not least, um, it's very important to focus on um, OPEX costs and bring those costs down. Uh, if, and here I think one of the main, um, main key components is major component replacement um, offshore. Uh, so, many challenges lay ahead of us, uh, and I'll be very happy to discuss those further with, um, with uh, all the participants uh, and, and everybody who is listening to us uh, today. Uh, and with this, I'm finishing my presentation. Thank you very much. Merci. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, Joanna, for this very comprehensive overview of the floating of showing challenges. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker for today, uh, Christoph, uh, over to you. Um, hello, everybody. 
um, hope um, my my um, screen is shared. Um, so yep. I will today talk a little bit about um, challenges of challenges of offshore wind. Before that, I will introduce you a little bit to EMBW. Hopefully, most of you are already aware of us. Um, we are the largest um, integrated utility in um, Germany, um, acting along the whole energy um, value chain. Um, but more important, um, we are also fully committed to. Um, net zero carbon emissions by 2035. Um, therefore, for more than 10 years now, we are also um, focusing on uh, renewable or adding renewable energy generation to our portfolio. And one um, key pillar, um, therefore, is offshore wind. Um, and, and that is what we will focus on today. Um, so currently, we are among the leaders in offshore wind market in Germany, um, meaning um, we put into operation the first commercial scale offshore wind farm um, back in 2011 in Germany. Now we operate uh, four offshore wind farms, um, also um, currently the biggest uh, capacity-wise biggest one who is in Albert was with plus 600 megawatts and also we are now having 900 megawatt hit right project already in the pipeline and very close to um, financial close. Um, which also at this time has been the first subsidy free bid handed in back in 2017. I think um, that also gives a good view on um, EMBW's willingness um, to also already enter markets where technology is not 100% major. Um, so we see that also we're floating offshore wind, but we are really believing into that. Um, next to what we have done, building up our legacy and offshore wind in Germany, um, we are also quite active uh, abroad. So within the last two years, we have been quite successful together with our uh, partner BP in UK. Um, so UK round four, we were able to secure a three gigawatt of site capacity, um, bottom fixed offshore. Um, and one year later in um, the Scotland auction, we also um, secured additional 2.9 gigawatt, summing up our project um, portfolio or pipeline currently to seven gigawatt. And um, yeah, next to that, we are also active in other markets, but um, here today, we also want to focus um, on floating. And, and here we started, yeah, exactly five years ago with engaging in ZRS and California. Um, so um, establishing our um, former joint venture um, with local, local company, um, Aaron is much um, well aware of um, Castle Wind, um, where we really started um, to to um, think about and, and deal with um, all the challenges ahead of us associated with floating and um, get, get more confidence on that one. So that is also what we are now applying um, for, for our upcoming auctions or for the upcoming auctions in, in France, um, floating auctions AO5 and AO6. Um, Joanna already talked about that. And next to that, we are also engaged in different uh, joint industry projects, but also um, pushing our own um, innovative floater design. You can see on the right hand side, Nessie Square, where we will see a first floater um, deployment um, two times 8.3 megawatt Mingyang turbines off the coast of China later this summer. Um, yeah, when we started five years ago, thinking about commercial scale um, floating offshore wind. So the time before Kinkadyne uh, went online, before Windflows went online, but other um, demonstrator projects too, was first really to make sure that we get a gigawatt scale um, project uh, and a technical feasible um, layout um, where it brings that together. And from that on, really working on optimizing that on an economic basis, but also always keeping in mind to have financing sector already on board early. Um, so that is a project finance point. Um, Joanna also mentioned, um, so congrats for that one, very important for the overall um, sector um, that, that we are getting this as a normal in future, but that's also, um, yeah, is, is connected to some requirements. We already need to be aware of early when starting the design process. And here, um, obviously in a more major technology compared to bottom fix, um, we, we 
the work packages not have been new. Um, that we already know, um, but we needed to adjust um, in more detail. Serial production of such floaters um, has other requirements and uh, other fabrication requirements as we have seen now with monopiles or even jackets, but um, very likely more complex. And, and Aaron will talk about that. Um, Joanna talked about the T&I and port infrastructure. Perhaps we also need more key site available. Specifically in Europe, this is a challenge um, where we um, need to build out um, port infrastructure. Again, um, O&M, currently we are talking about tow back to port solutions. Um, where very likely from business cases we have seen so far um, one of the biggest um, drivers for viable business case is turbine availability. That is also closely connected to accessibility of a floater. Um, so we need to make sure that even with harsh um, environmental conditions, um, we can enter the, uh, the structure um, to keep our turbines running. Um, two completely or very new um, items is the station keeping system where we have some track record associated with oil and gas and it's great to have oil and gas players on board here um, but but this is something we haven't seen for bottom fix offshore wind um, beforehand um, same for dynamic part of the entire array cables um, where, where we also see now um, there's a lot of ongoing a lot of innovation a lot of development and, and we are very happy about that um, same for turbines um, currently we have seen and, and we are at the moment only have very few OEMs for offshore wind available. So Vestas, Siemens, Gamesa um, have engaged with um, pilot and demonstration projects, um, but hopefully we can get some also to have a more integrated approach and coming into the project much earlier um, to, to have a more optimized design between the floating substructure and the turbine. Um, so I think that is all not new. We have seen that 10 years before with bottom fix. Now we are doing that with floating. So I'm very, very confident that we are getting this done. Um, but also from the bottom fix, um, we see, we already know what needs to be in place to, to make um, floating also um, a commercial success. Um, here on the left hand side, you will see we, from the beginning, we need a suitable regulatory framework. Um, so the, a carve out of floating um, like we see in France um, that, that we have a competition between different developers but within the same, um, the same technology. Um, we have seen that early stakeholder engagement is, is very, very important when it comes to our permitting timelines, project schedules. And in, in parallel, we also need to already ask the right questions early um, that we have also some lead time um, to, to get the right work done, to have uh, the right um, level of solutions available when needed for um, gigawatt um, deployment. Same as for the track record, currently they're literally floating around a lot of different designs, much more than we as developers uh, would like to see, to be honest. Um, we will see um, also here a deduction of that, um, only a few by the end of the decade, but this is very important that those ones then building up the right level of track record, that we also get the insurance and financing back sector on board. Um, yeah. Um, from the storyline, it's also important um, that supply chain as a critical item needs to have um, the confidence that there is a viable project pipeline um, behind that to make early investments um, and, and that at the same time will be much of importance to get costs down associated with um, CAPEX, specifically here's a substructure, but also station keeping systems. Um, so a lot of challenges. Um, associated with that one, but we already have good solutions from other sectors. I think um, within the last five years, we have done a lot of steps in the right directions. Um, it's important that all the associated partners um, keeps communications channels open. That's why it's also very important to have such formats like um, we have here um, to go in the right um, direction and, and make floating happen. Um, here also you can see some 
items which normally we applied within the last 10 years of a bottom fix to get the cost significantly down um, and that the same we will see for floating offshore wind for sure um, yeah thanks a lot yeah uh, great uh, thank you very much Christoph uh, for this great um, overview of um, the activities and the challenges and now I'm happy uh, to welcome our final speaker for today um, Aaron Aaron uh, over to you okay fantastic well, thank you for welcoming me to speak today. Um, great to hear the perspective from customers and um, look forward to sharing our perspective as a technology developer. Um, I think I'd like to start by talking a bit about the um, opportunity, which is why we go after uh, these challenges, and a little bit about what we think has been proven in the industry so far. And then we can get to what the challenges really are. Um, so, just a, a few words about the motivation for floating offshore wind. This is something that the world needs. We need to build out uh, a huge amount of capacity by 2050 to meet our net zero challenges and maintain a 1.5 degree Celsius pathway. Um, offshore wind represents one of the largest potential sources of energy that is um, widely available to, to nations, especially coastal nations. And we're going to need both fixed and floating offshore wind, which are complementary to, to do this. Um, just to put everything in perspective, in 2020, we deployed about six gigawatts per year of offshore wind, and we need to scale this to 80 gigawatts by 2030. So that is just a tremendous jump in capacity. It means that we're going to need to expand the industry to markets that have not yet had track record, and we're going to build just a, an enormous amount of supply chain capacity. And our perspective is that that's where the majority of the, the problems are uh, right now is, is how to get the right policy environments in place and how to um, enable the right conditions for these supply chains to develop. Um, just a few words about the wind float. So this is a three column semi submersible with a wind turbine located on one column designed to work with any commercial wind turbine. Um, while we certainly like to see that wind turbine manufacturers are starting to take floating to account in their designs, we don't expect to see specific floating variants for some time until the industry gains scale. So right now, our focus is on really working with these proven bankable um, floating off or wind turbines with uh, very limited changes to the nacelle. Um, that's worked fine so far. The wind float itself is a lightweight and modular structure. It's designed to be flexible in terms of um, how the modules come together so that we can give our customers options about how to set up these supply chains and um, it has a hull trim system. This basically is a uh, very low frequency um, system that shifts water ballast between the columns to keep the turbine at vertical. And what we see is that this is boosting energy production by about two to 3% versus passive systems, which can yield a substantial return uh, in terms of MPV. And finally, uh, the wind float has a relatively low draft and that's adjustable to enable uh, heavy lifting to take place in port, which minimizes costs and risks um, across the project. We have a 15 year track record now in floating offshore wind. Um, this started with the deployment of the wind float one, two megawatts back in 2011 in Portugal. That unit operated for a further two years up in Kincardine in Scotland. We built with our, our partners, the Wind Float Atlantic project um, back in uh, 2020 coming online. And so now we are operating that for about three years. We then um, moved to the Kincardine project, which is uh, five 9.5 megawatt turbines operating off the coast of Scotland. And um, now the EFGL project is under construction in France, and that'll be uh, three by 10 megawatt turbines from Vestas. So, with this experience, um, we believe that the wind, wind float is fully ready for commercial uh, projects, and we are supporting industrial scale projects globally with a fourth generation design. So really taking all the feedback back in. So now I'll turn to share about our kind of six key proof points uh, about where this technology stands today and talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned there. So first, I think it's fully proven now that we can deliver high performance in very challenging operating in extreme conditions. We've generated over 300 gigawatt hours 
across different types of site conditions. We've seen very large storms with waves up to 17 meters and wind speeds approaching uh, 60 knots, or sorry, 60 meters per second. And all the while we're delivering really exceptional stability. So for us, that experience and track record with these eight to 10 megawatt turbines is giving us the confidence to move to the next generation of turbines uh, with rated capacities above 15 megawatts. And it, it's been very helpful to um, validate our numerical models. And with that experience, we can be confident that as we move to other sites, we will be um, designing structures that will work very well. Uh, the second aspect touched by my colleagues is, is bankability. So the uh, Windfloat Atlantic project was bank financed. The EFGL project has now achieved a non-recourse financing back in the spring. Um, this is a financial structure that is backed by multilaterals, so it matches some of the early um, experience with fixed bottom offshore wind projects, and it also brings together commercial banks into the mix um, with a structure that is quite similar to what you might see on a fixed bottom project. Um, I think as we look at uh, the, the bankability, we see that um, it's always a, a very project specific um, conversation. We don't see too much in the way of uh, questions about the technology and how the technology is going to perform in these due diligence process. A lot of it is really based on um, the project conditions and the regulatory environment, um, the, the you know, structure of, of the kind of commercial timelines and, and that sort of thing. So we think that this is um, easily transferable to the large commercial projects and it just make, means that these projects have to be in a stable uh, policy and regulatory environment. Uh, the third one is that proven that the wind float can be fabricated and installed in small series production. Um, on the left hand side you have the construction and loadout operation from the Kincardine uh, floating wind farm and at the right hand side you see um, the turbines lined up for the wind float Atlantic installation campaign. Now these small commercial projects uh, they're all done on the basis of existing infrastructure and so you know they really don't have the scale to enable new investment. They also have objectives of proving out the technology and, and not necessarily delivering in industrial scale supply chains but through this experience you gain insights into where the bottlenecks are in the different processes and you can start challenging working on those bottlenecks to make sure that as we do move to industrial scale we minimize the risk of schedule delays and we uh, improve the design for fabrication, design for installation. When we look at uh, the operations, so principal power does provide uh, the platform operations scope from Windflow 1 to Windflow Atlantic and uh, in Kincardine. We've been uh, able to deliver really exceptional system reliability, develop and improve our processes, and um, we're delivering over 99% availability of the platforms right now. So for us, that's uh, an excel excellent signal. Um, we're able to work in, in coordination with wind turbine manufacturer to uh, perform our scheduled maintenance, which means that we're not adding any additional downtime related to performing scheduled maintenance on the, the floating substructure because it can be completed within the window um, that the wind turbine manufacturers use. Um, and the Fifth point is, I think we have proven that the tow to shore is a viable option for wind turbine large correctives. You never want to see um, warranty issues that mean you've got to respond to the uh, to, to a, a large corrective failure, but you do want to make sure that you have a solution that is workable. And through uh, performing the large corrective operation at King Carden last summer, the you know, technical aspects went very, very smooth. So from the uh, disconnection, towing, port operations, and reconnection, um, very smooth, but there's a lot of lessons learned there about how projects should engage with the supply chain and how they should set things up commercially um, and what the requirements are uh, for infrastructure to make sure that uh, these operations can be conducted in a uh, time that really minimizes downtime. And as we look at this in commercial projects as we look at um, you know setting up frame agreements and making sure that there are good contingency plans in place we see that you can basically minimize this operation to take place from start to finish in less than a month which in general is uh, less than the time that it takes to mobilize heavy lift vessels at the same time we are looking at those sort of future solutions um, for for intervening 
on site and uh, I think we will certainly be using them if if they come to the right degree of maturity but ultimately um, we think it's it's very important to have um, an option that that you know is going to work and also that um, even having multiple options for how you might respond uh, might be important in different situations. Uh, the, the sixth point is something I think we're really proud of, um, and that's basically that we have an outstanding track record from a health, safety, and environment perspective. So we're delivering these projects with no lost time incidents, um, and there is no negative effect to the environment from installing the floating offshore wind projects and operating them. We, we see that um, you really have a, a, a you know good responsible siting, and then you have um, I guess a, a environment where the floating offshore wind turbines are, are operating and not disturbing marine life. And um, as you can see on the screen, our, our uh, local dolphins in Vienna de Castello really like these these units. Um, so with all of this, we believe that the technology is ready to enable a rapid build out of commercial floating wind projects now. Um, we identify a number of opportunities for technology innovation, and that can progress in parallel. But this all has to be done in the context of project and innovation cycles, where building experience, going and gaining um, the lessons learned, it does take time to incorporate that back into new designs. And um, we need to make sure when we make decisions in the early phases of, of projects that we are uh, adopting technology solutions that are going to work and and survive the uh, scrutiny of the, the bankers and insurers as we go into um, those more detailed phases. And so when we look at evaluating um, our own technology roadmap, we look at when things are going to be mature enough to go into a feed, which is when you really need to freeze the main assumptions for the project, and then you spend your time maturing um, the the elements towards a eventual financial close. Um, we've seen in, in you know, the fixed bottom space that definitely sometimes people adopt technologies that um, end up posing quite a lot of challenges during execution. Um, and you want to make sure that you, I think sponsors just have a role that they carefully consider how many innovations they're stacking on top of each other in large scale projects. The more innovative components, unproven components, the more scrutiny you're going to have about how everything comes together from a technical perspective, also a commercial and schedule perspective from your bankers and your insurers. So maintaining that level of insurability means having a really rigorous process of qualifying technology and making sure your contractors are experienced. Um, so while we do believe that there are uh, that the technology is proven and ready to go, it's clear that there are challenges uh, for the industry. But our view is that really these challenges can only be proven on industrial scale projects. Um, first one is marine spatial planning, permitting processes to enable projects to be delivered on predictable timelines. Still, there's a lot of questions about um, the how regulators will balance the different interests of different players in the ocean. And we don't see project timelines sticking to the right schedules. And that's a problem for supply chain investments. Um, we welcome the floating specific auctions and subsidy schemes that we're seeing in, in different areas. Um, we know that as we build up these initial supply chains and capacity that um, it is important to make sure that floating offshore wind is uh, ring fenced and, and does have um, support to, to help us on the cost reduction trajectory. Um, but we know that the objective has to be subsidy free offtake. So we want to make sure that um, this is all balanced. I think the both my, my colleagues hit on the availability of port infrastructure. Um, this is a huge point for floating offshore wind where a lot of the construction and, and operations will take place in port. And um, just like any new market, you know, you look at uh, the west coast of the US, for example, and there's a tremendous amount of investment that will need to take place there to build some readiness for offshore wind. It's similar to what happened, for example, on the east coast of the US or in Europe to support the fixed bottom industry. But that really needs a concerted effort from public and private players to um, enable those investments and make sure that they're ready in time to support construction and to support the development of the local supply chain, which really needs to see the signal that those ports are in place before they make their own investments in facilities. Um, that those investments in supply chains to build the capacity to deliver industrial scale projects, not a small lift. And it's something where 
uh, private entities really need to see that there is a commitment from the government towards the industry and that has to go beyond single products projects so that's a I guess a quite a big risk for um, the industry is that in order to build these um, supply chains and and you know attract the suppliers that really have these capacities we need to demonstrate that there's going to be a stable and sustainable investment environment um, and then the the final point here is that you know as we're building small projects we can use um, the existing technology around export systems um, where you know projects are using 66 kV cables and everything as we get towards uh, the larger projects we need to make sure that we're qualifying the higher voltage export systems including cables and substations and that they're ready in time for these projects so that's that's a key point but of course the demand only comes when there are the projects in the pipeline with the time frame so great to see contractors working on those points and our takeaway message here is that in order to realize this opportunity of floating offshore wind worldwide, we really do need the help of policymakers and regulators to overcome these remaining challenges. Um, this means that we need long-term commitments, streamlined regulations, and predictable project timelines um, in order to basically have the industry solve the other problems. Um, everything else we think are, are problems that, uh, you know, or adaptability that comes with progressing an individual project and that the industry will be able to come up with solutions. Thank you very much and look forward to the discussion. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Aaron, for this very insightful presentation with many videos and, and pictures. So we have a, a little bit less than 15 minutes for the Q&A session. And I invite uh, Bruno and all other speakers for today uh, to please turn their cameras on. And Bruno, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. <clears throat> to our, our uh, incredible speakers who managed to give us a, 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 real, uh, a real overview of what floating wind is basically all about today. Uh, Aaron, let me stick with you uh, a bit. Um, we, we have a large audience uh, and, and a wide variety of, of, of members at WFO, some uh, representing technologies with more or less track record or experience. So, I mean, you represent a technology that, that has uh, a proven track record and, and, and um, some, some, some good history. And you expressed uh, the challenges you saw as an experienced player. Um, but for, for, for the, 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 the players with less experience, less track record, um, what are, in your mind, the biggest challenges for, for those players who would like to access this market? Um, is it bankability? Is it insurability? Is it, um, uh, we know that floating wind works. Uh, is, it, is it technical validation? What are you, what, where do you think they should focus their efforts on if they want to, uh, like other players, capture this unbelievable market? I think it's it's a really wide variety of, uh, of 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 topics. I mean, as we went through our process, it was a lot about learning the industry, learning uh, the customer base, learning the drivers in offshore wind versus onshore renewables or oil and gas, where a lot of our our heritage comes from. And um, I think the demonstration projects really are important to have a way to develop the kind of competence and understanding um you know get things right get things wrong at, at a scale that is um manageable and achievable and i think you know every company has to decide how much risk it's willing to take and their customers will have to decide how much risk they they are willing to take but from our perspective we certainly would not um i think have been able to take the risk on commercial projects that we would be able to take now um, without doing without getting this kind of track record mm -hmm. uh, thank you Aaron uh, Joanna um, you you have I mean an EDF in general has experience working on a pilot project observing single unit demonstrators with different players across the globe uh, working and preparing commercial skill projects and tenders um, do you think that experience of an EDF's experience working on, on a pilot project has 
um, brought you a lot in terms of interface management. We know we know that in a project you have, you know, you have you have to deal with the wind turbine manufacturers, the offshore installers. You have to deal with the, the lenders, the insurance companies. Um, so in terms of interface management, which is often uh, underrated, what what is your experience and how critical is that experience to be able to then later on address commercial scale projects? Thank you for this question, Bruno. I think it's a it's a very important topic. Uh, indeed, uh, a lot of projects um, fixed or floating are about interfaces, uh, interfaces from technical point of view, but also interfaces from contractual point of view. Uh, and uh, I think floating even more than fixed offshore will be faced with those issues. Uh, because technically the interaction between the wind turbine, the floater, uh, the cable system is even more important and it's even more twinkled and intertwined than, than, than fixed. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's a crucial point and for sure um, pilot projects such as the Provence Grand Large project I mentioned uh, were great, a great way to, to learn about this, a great learn to learn about how to set up contracts uh, between different parties, um, how to manage those uh, those interfaces, uh, and and for sure um, it enables us to gain confidence uh, in in this area and be better prepared for for commercial deployment when such uh, issues will be well even further multiplied and 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 even more important. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Christoph, representing as as a representative of ENBW, who has quite a, a large track record in bottom fixed. Um, I have two questions. First, how, how valuable at this point is that bottom fixed experience uh, for a company like yourself looking at floating? We know that about 70% of the capex of a bottom fixed and floating wind farm are, are rather similar, but then you have that delta. So how valuable is that bottom fixed expertise? And, and second thing, uh, how do you see the contractual evolution uh, in terms of EPCI, I mean, right now with bottom fixed, you have uh, developers and utilities with very large engineering teams capable on on taking quite a lot of risk and and, and uh, slice up the different work packages. Um, with with floating wind, how do you see that evolve? Do you see us going quickly to a multi-package strategy? Do you see still a lot of initial projects with a fully PCI approach and, 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 and turnkey approach as, as, a, as a developer. So I'd, I'd like to have your, your feedback on, the, on those two subjects. So um, referring to your first, so um, what is a valuable asset is, is a very um, grown um, relationship with the turbine manufacturers, um, specifically when looking into the future and seeing that we really have quite great growth path associated with a limited um, capabilities of uh, fabrication um, and HR also at the OEMs. Um, so that is something um, EMBW is benefiting from. Um, on the other hand, um, that gives us an idea what is also required and also need to be considered early when it comes to the foundation. And the floating substructure is is more complex than a monopile now. Um, that is that is for sure right. Um, that's why it is important um, to already engage early um, with the right um, companies like we are talking here. And as I said, um, we as developers are also quite um, interested in seeing seeing um, only a few um, considerable um, designers we can really focus on. I think the same applies for the rest of the supply chain, um, that we are not stretching that too much and really can optimize um, from from there on and stay focused. Um, to, to the second part of your question, when it comes to multi-contracting, I think, um, what we have done during our last four and now the fifth project is really an evolution, um, starting from a more EPCI driven approach, also dictated by non recourse financing um, requirements, really to get more and more um, able to go more and more into direction of multi contracting, but also 
having more comfort with um, managing those interfaces because we grow with Zabon. We build um, we build um, offshore wind farms, and from each and every offshore wind farm, we took also lessons, um, which then helped us um, to to really have. Um, the best way forward and and yeah also to optimize installation schedules but also constructing schemes and bottom fix obviously a much more competitive um, environment and we will see the same for floating in future well thank you uh, any any last remarks from our panel uh, that I want to thank and I'm sure Ilya will will do the same I of course want to thank the audience that connected uh, in very high numbers. Um, one last remark from Aaron, from Joanna, or from Chris. Uh, if if you had to, uh, I don't know, guess, say, say one word. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it, it's um, just responding to Christoph's last point. I think you know every project will be different. Every sponsor has their different ways to carry things forward, and and so. We see customers that are looking at um, multi-contract solutions right now, and and we see customers that are looking at uh, EPCI solutions. And so it's not necessarily about you know whether you make one decision or the other, but it's about how you run the process and how you um, are are uh, choosing what's right for for yourself as a developer. So I think you know both can work, and and we'll, we're going to see a lot of flexibility across the the um, industry. And we as as Designers and supply chain companies need to be flexible in terms of how we um, work to, to serve those needs. And it's going to take a lot to build this industry, but the opportunity is just enormous. So look forward to working with you all to do it. True that, Aaron. True that. Jana, one last closing remark, perhaps? Yeah, yes, indeed. Um, Aaron is right. I think there's, uh, there's still a lot to invent in this industry. It's a very exciting and challenging industry. Uh, and I think uh, every project needs to find its uh, its way to deal with uh, with these existing challenges. Uh, but but I'm sure that we will see a lot of floating projects in the near future, and and the future is really bright for for floating wind. Thank you, Christoph. One last word. Yeah. I think I think um, at the moment in floating offshore wind, we are there where we have been with bottom fix ten years ago, and. Um, we we have seen how that went out, um, so we are quite um, positive uh, for floating offshore wind of future, and that will even uh, be added up with green hydrogen economy. So I think there's a lot of happening in favor of floating offshore wind. Um, so future is bright. Thank you, and those are words I like to hear not only from technology providers, but first and foremost from leading developers uh, that. Uh, that um, have a lot of, ultimately a lot of power, no pun intended, in their hands. Thank you very much. Ilya, back to yes. you. Yes, great. Thank you very much for this wonderful discussion. We have tons of questions today. I don't even know how to count them, like 30, 40 questions. But unfortunately, it's just not possible to address this to you, uh, taking into consideration the format of this webinar. But anyway, I thank you very much, all of you, for attending. Uh, this session for your excellent presentations bruno thank you very much for the q a session and i look forward to see you in the in our next webinars and thank you very much for the audience attending this session it was a pleasure to receive so many questions today and yeah have a great rest of the day everyone and last thing our next uh, webinar would be uh, the general one will be in april on the technological uh, challenges uh, please join it join us so all the best. One last thing. Uh, WFO is organizing in conjunction with RIAS, which is, uh, which is Japan's largest renewable energy association, uh, Asia's first floating offshore wind event called FOWA, and that will be in two weeks on the 9th and 10th of uh, March in Tokyo. So we hope to see you guys there uh, and as many as possible. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks all.